conversation about post-surgical movement, including range of motion, cording, and lymphedema. My name is Melissa Rosen. I'm the Director of Training and Education for Char Sherrod. I'm going to be your host tonight. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items I would like to share with you. Firstly, I want to thank our sponsors for this important webinar. We are grateful to the following. Ezai, GSK, Merck, CGEN, the CDC and the Cooperative Agreement DP19-1906, and the Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund. They generously enable Char Sherrod to continue to provide education and support surrounding genetics, breast and ovarian cancers. A reminder that tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Char Sherrod's website along with a transcript. Participants, names and bases will not be a part of that recording. You may have noticed that participants were muted upon entry. Please maintain your mute status throughout the call. I have to say we received many, many, many questions before the call. A crazy number of questions. So you'll notice that some of these questions were combined. So be sure to listen for not your exact wording if you posted a question, but the topic that you were interested in. We expect additional questions now, of course. Please use the chat box, which you can access at the bottom of the screen to ask any questions. And of course, any questions that we don't get to tonight will be answered via, um, via either email or a, um, a post on our website over the course of this week. As a reminder, Char Sherrod has been providing support services to the breast and ovarian cancer communities for 20 years. Our resources are 100% confidential and 100% free. In addition to our amazing clinical team that speaks to those impacted by these cancers and our many formal resources, kits, subsidies, and programs to help women and their families navigate different aspects of the cancer experience, I want to remind you tonight of what you can find on our website. We have a wealth of information, a library of past webinar recordings, and an entire section devoted to video demonstrations to help you with range of motion, lymphedema, and other stretches and exercises. That link is actually in the chat box right now. And we'll put that in our follow-up email as well. You see that's our survivorship and healthy living section. Scroll down the tiniest bit and click a box that says exercise resources. As we move into the webinar itself, I want to remind you that Charcheret is a national nonprofit cancer support and education organization and does not provide any medical advice or perform any medical procedures. The information provided by Char Sherrod and tonight by our two guest speakers is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment for specific medical conditions. You should not use this advice or information to diagnose or treat a health problem. Always seek the advice of your physician or a qualified healthcare provider familiar with your case with any questions or that you ha may have regarding a medical condition. Okay, let's get to it. We are so very fortunate to have two wonderful speakers joining us tonight. Jenny Ray, who is a master of, holds a Master of Science in Physical Therapy, is the founder of MyBreastySays.com and received her master's degree in Physical Therapy from Ithaca College. She's a certified lymphedema therapist who completed her training with the Academy of Lymphatic Studies. She is also a Reiki and cranial sacral practitioner and likes to combine elements of yoga and Pilates and mindfulness into her practice. Tonight, Jenny will be educating us about lymphedema and cording during the breast cancer experience. Our second speaker is Karen Shore Ganak. She holds a Master's of Science in um, Occupational Therapy 
and she is registered and licensed in that. She worked for over a decade in fitness as a group exercise instructor and a master's a person, a master personal trainer before returning to school to pursue a degree in occupational therapy. She received that degree from SUNY Downstate and earned all three of her American Occupational Therapies badges in cancer rehabilitation. She will be speaking tonight about range of motion during the cancer experience. Okay, I am going to turn the screen over to Jenny who will be our first speaker. And uh, I know you're going to learn a lot tonight. Thank you so much for that introduction, Melissa. And thank you to everyone joining us this evening. Um, let's get started. I put together a PowerPoint and I have to say um, from the get-go that this, this is gonna be a, a, a lot to cover. Like these two topics, we could really do separate topics. So luckily I, I am in Los Angeles, but I'm also a native New Yorker. So I'm gonna do my best to speak as quickly as I can and get through the topics, hopefully as clearly as possible as well. Um, so my goal for this first presentation about lymphedema is really to take a lot of the fear about it by explaining to you really what's going on with the whole concept. So we're going to start with what is the lymphatic system because that's not really something a lot of us either learned in school or if we did learn, certainly don't really remember. Um, so the lymphatic system, its main focus is to clear junk from our body. Um, sometimes we affectionately refer to it as the sewer system of our body. Um, and when I say junk, I mean things such as old cells, excess fluid, lactic acid, that, that stuff that causes the muscles to feel burning when we exercise. And it does that using what I'm going to refer to as freeways to kind of move the fluid through the body. So just like our circulatory system moves blood through the body, you know, it uses its own kind of fluid or freeways, excuse me, um, the veins and the arteries, the lymphatic system also has its own little freeways. And here you can see the freeway. So if you can see my little cursor here, um, all of these green lines, those are the freeways, but then you'll also see these little dots. Sorry, Jenny. Yes. Yeah, Jenny, we, we actually... don't see your screen. Oh, okay. You don't, so you don't see anything. You just see me? Your lovely face. Oh, hmm. Okay, let's go back to, uh, uh, whoops, that was totally the wrong button. Okay, let me huh, go back to Zoom and share screen. Ah, let's see. I can share screen. Hmm. It's saying that I'm sharing the screen, but no one can see it. Advanced sharing options. Multiple persons can share. Who can share? And I am a host still, correct? Yes. Hmm. So I know that it's difficult to do this, but I'm going to ask if mm -hmm. you can talk us through and do your best to sort of present image, you know, present images verbally. <laughs> I can. I have them all right here, so I can. All right. Thank you. you got it. Here we go, ladies. Let's go on the fly. Um, thankfully, I've done this presentation a lot of times. So nodes are, um, so what I was indicating, which you couldn't see because I thought you could see the cursor, um, the nodes are only in specific places in the body. So they are like up here in our neck, in our, our armpits, in the groin. Um, and then they are connected by those kind of freeways. Um, and the, the lymph nodes act kind of like the custom agents along the, uh, the freeways. Like so, meaning you're traveling along in your car and you go through the node and then the node checks to make sure what's going on. Meaning like, is the fluid that's coming through this node, is it okay? Does it have a bacteria in there? Is there a virus? Is it something kind of suspicious? If it is suspicious, it then alerts the rest of the... Um, the, the immune system, to, it kind of perks it up. So one way that we've all experienced that is when we um, say like, oh, my glands are swollen. I think I'm coming down with something. And that's, those are actually lymph nodes that are in our throat. And they've detected something that's coming through our nose or our mouth or something of that nature. Um, Okay, so cancer treatment can disrupt this in two major ways. Um, the first is by removing the lymph nodes. 
And the second is through radiation treatment. And what happens with radiation treatment is it, those uh, pathways, just like I was saying, like the, the pathways that the fluid travels, they can get damaged. Um, this can also kind of happen with scars. So if you end up having really significant scars from treatment, um, that can also impede the, uh, the pathway of the fluids as well. Um, so when all of, if you have a disruption in the flow of the lymph fluid because of radiation or what have you, um, that, or as Noreen is saying to everyone also, or the cancer itself, the tumor blocking that pathway, um, the, the fluid will back up and that backup of fluid is what we refer to as lymphedema. Now, lymphedema can form um, really anywhere, um, there's a lymph node, really anywhere in the body. So the lymph nodes each drain a specific uh, like a map of the body. So for example, the armpits drain the arm, the breast, and then the shoulder blade, like the opposite side of the breast, like the backside, um, which is, so if you had breast cancer and you had your armpit nodes removed, any of that area could become swollen. If you had ovarian cancer, a gynecological cancer, something more like down into your stomach, um, that could lead to a genital lymphedema, like swelling of the labia or leg swelling. Um, and if you had a head and neck cancer, you could have swelling in your face, you know, that as well. So it's not only in the arm. I should also mention, the, what we're talking about tonight is referred to as secondary cancer, meaning, or excuse me, secondary lymphedema, meaning you were born with a robust, healthy lymphatic system that was doing its job, going along fine, and then it was insulted by these cancer treatments. There are some people who are just born without a, a lymphatic system that just can't keep up with the demands. They've never had cancer treatment. They just were born that way. That's primary lymphedema, and that's a totally different story. So all of this is about... Uh, cancer related. Okay. So why is, um, like what, what's, why don't we want lymphedema? Like what are the negatives of lymphedema? Uh, the first one is probably the most obvious one, which is just the look of it, the cosmetics, the asymmetry, um, maybe not being able to find a shoe that fits if it's in your leg or um, having one arm larger than the other. Um, your skin can also change in texture, so it can become bumpy or uh, the color might change. Um, you know, it can get thicker, like it, it'll just, it can be different. Um, probably the most dangerous aspect of lymphedema, if we're to use the word danger, would be that you could get infections or even recurrent infections that could land you in the hospital. Um, that's because swollen skin is not as strong as regular old skin. And skin's main job, like it's our largest organ and its main job is to keep all of the nasties in the world, the, the germs, the viruses, the fungus, et cetera, et cetera, to keep them from getting into the inside of our body. When we have a swollen body part, the skin kind of stretches out, making it a little easier for those bad guys to get in there. Um, and, you know, it, because of that, it's a lot easier to get an infection. Um, now for probably the million dollar question is how do I prevent lymphedema if I've had cancer treatment? And unfortunately, the, the honest truth is you cannot 100% prevent, not 100% prevent it. Um, but what you can do, and we're going to talk about this next, you can minimize your risk. Um, so let's talk about what are the risk factors. Um, so there are four major risk factors. Side note here, I'm going to send you guys, hopefully when we send out the follow-up, I'm going to send you all my slides. They are so lovely and I'm bummed that you can't see them, but all this will be on the slides, so don't worry about like taking notes. So you'll have all this info. I just want to put it out there. But um, anyway, sorry, so four major risk factors. So put down your pens if you're furiously writing. Um, and these four risk factors, the way we... Um, the way we have come to land on these four is um, these are what the research has backed up. So you might hear from your neighbor like, oh, I heard, you know, so-and-so 
this triggered her is like, it may have for so-and-so, but what the research has shown are these four things. So the first one is radiation treatment. Um, the second one is um, the amount of lymph nodes removed. And the third one is an infection. And the fourth is obesity. So what your BMI is. Um, now those first two, the radiation and the amount of lymph nodes removed, there's really not much we can do about that. Like a lot of that is what your oncology team decides based on uh, their experience, you know, your cancer, all of those sorts of things. And um, since we're going, we're talking about the oncology team for a minute, a question that came up in um, when someone asked ahead of time, and it comes up often is why, do, why doesn't the oncology team mention this? Like, why doesn't anyone talk about lymphedema? I have an answer. Um, there was a study done in 2011 that said at that time uh, in medical schools, physicians learned 30 minutes about lymphedema. So in all of medical school, they spent 30 minutes. Now, if you compare that to, um, to become a certified lymphedema therapist, we spend 135 hours. So that's a huge difference. And I... Um, I don't know why that is in this country. Uh, in Europe, it seems to be much more accepted in, in, in part of treatment. But um, so although, you know, your radiation oncologist is the expert in radiation, your oncologist is the expert in which chemo you need. Um, this is just, you know, they, they are experts in their field, but lymphedema is just one field. They're not great at plowing. So that's what, you know, you just, just find your lymphedema therapist for that one. So not their fault. They just weren't taught that. And again, this is 2011. Who knows what they learned when they went to school in whatever decade they went to school in. Um, okay, so let's, we're going to go through the two risk-reducing behaviors that we do have control over, which is, again, infection in, in weight. So we'll start with infection. Like I said before, um, if you have a swollen limb, that could make the skin easy, it's easier to get a germ inside. But say you don't have a swollen limb, you're just living your life, you're missing some lymph nodes. Um, why should I worry about infection? Well, it's possible that um, after you've gone through chemo or radiation, I know it's, it's not uncommon to have your immune system compromised for a while. Um, even if uh, your immune system is doing fine, just take the precaution and if you um, get a paper cut, just, you know, don't do like, huh, hmm, paper cut. Okay. And go on, you know, just actually instead go to the, the sink, wash it with soap and water, put a little neosporin, put a bandaid on it, go on with your day. Um, now I should say in the, the paper cut example, that's assuming I had breast cancer and it was, you know, on this side. If I got a paper cut on the other side, it doesn't matter. If I had ovarian cancer on my left side, that would pertain to my left leg. So it kind of goes with um, the limb we worry about is the limb that, that uh, correlates to where the lymph nodes were or the can original cancer was. So um, I don't want, if you had breast cancer to where you got, uh, you stepped on glass or I mean, I don't want anyone to step on glass, but like, don't worry, you're gonna get lymphedema because you hurt your foot. Uh, and you're not gonna lymphedema in your arm because you hurt your foot, if that makes sense. Um, so some other things to think about, you may have heard the kind of a, a prior common breast cancer warning was don't get manicures, like, ah, oh. and it's not that um, nail polish itself is going to trigger lymphedema. It's just that being in the salon, um, you know, they, if it's not clean or we've all seen that expose in 2020 where there's fungus everywhere or they're reusing the the products and the tools. So just make sure that if you do get a manicure and you're at risk for upper your arms, um, bring your own tools or maybe ask them not to cut the cuticles because cuticles are where mine always bleed at the nail salon. That's where like you could get a little cut and then the germs could enter. Um, if you've had ovarian or any other kind of gynecological cancer, um, stomach cancer, um, so that would apply to pedicures, you know, anything if you're at risk for leg lymphedema, if you go get a pedicure, just be extra careful that it's extra clean and there's no risk of getting any sort of infection because infections um, do have, um, can certainly 
is at risk for gain lymphedema. I'm just going to, Brenda just post, I'm not going to comment on all the chats, but Brenda asked about blood pressure. The blood pressure that falls into one of the, that category of like things we think make a difference, but there hasn't been any research that really backs it up. So yeah, like try to do your, if you're at risk, you had cancer on the right side, try to get your blood pressure on the left. But, um, I, because we only have control over so many things and it could literally make you crazy. We are sticking to the things that research backs up and will make a big difference. Um, so that's why I'm not mentioning blood pressure today, but that's probably one a lot of you have heard is don't do blood pressure on that. Uh, um, but the thought is it can cut off the flow. It's also very temporary. I mean, you don't walk around with a blood pressure cuff on your arm for like an hour and a half. So, um, okay. So that's basically the idea behind um, avoiding infection. Also try to avoid uh, um, sunburns if you're in the sun. I mean, for a million reasons, we should be wearing our sunscreen. Um, bug bites, like do your best to avoid getting bug bites on the involved area. Um, yeah, in that is that. Okay, so our second risk factor that is in our under our control, sort of, is um, our weight. And um, they have found that um, if your BMI, so that's body mass index, if it's over 25, you have an increased risk for lymphedema. Um, I'm sure more than half of you are like, oh man, I have literally no idea what my BMI is. Um, so if you're sitting here thinking that, um, if you type into a Google or any search engine BMI calculator, it'll pop right up. And as long as you know your height and weight, it will tell you what your BMI is. So um, it's easy to figure it out. But um, now's the time where I step on a soapbox for a moment. If you find that you're like, oh man, my BMI is really not where I would like it to be now that I've done the calculations, um, ask for help. And I feel so passionate about that because um, losing weight is not easy on a good day and um, less easy when you are recovering from a major illness and let alone a major illness that if you've had breast cancer or even ovarian cancer that may have put you into menopause. Um, you know, so it kind of makes me nuts when doctors, even if it's not cancer related, it's like, oh, you know, you're at risk, you're on the border for diabetes, go exercise. And, you know, it's not that simple. So either, um, you know, speak with a nutritionist. It'd be great if there's someone at, like, if Sharshara could recommend someone who works with uh, people who have had cancer or, um, or talk to uh, like functional medicine people or, um, different dietitians, fine. Like physical therapists are great. We love to help you get an exercise routine. And I know there's also probably some of you on here who are like, oh, my personal trainer is so good. And they probably are, but also going to put a pitch in. If you are on Arimidex, Tamoxifen, any of those uh, estrogen suppressors, they um, can increase your risk for some joint pain and some those sorts of things. Um, so you might want to work with someone who has a little bit more education than your personal trainer, like a physical therapist. So find your local PT. They are more than happy to help get you um, pointed in the right direction. So stepping off the soapbox about that one. Okay, so next, next point here. How do I know if I have lymphedema? Okay, um, so for, I'm going to teach the ladies. So if anyone who had had breast cancer, I'm going to teach you very quickly how you monitor yourself. Um, and what you do is you basically just like look at, just get to know your arms. You're going to look at your wrists. So you kind of like look here and think, oh yeah, yep. I can see, I see tendons. I see veins. Yep. Kind of looks the same. Um, then you're going to flip your hands over. Mm -hmm. Yep. See those tendons. That looks the same. Um, and then the third way is if you were to bend your elbows and then look in the mirror that way, sometimes uh, the lymphedema, like the swelling will just kind of hang out there. So you might see like one side is a little chubbier than the other. That can also be a way. So I would encourage you just to get into a habit of doing that. Um, so you know what's a baseline. So um, if at one point you're like, huh, oh yeah, I actually can't see the crease on my wrist as well. That's a sign that you're going to, you're catching it super early. Um, you also might notice that there's a feeling of heaviness in that arm um, before you even notice anything. Uh, there's some, I read somewhere once that 
women or can tell that they're swelling before sometimes our tape measures can even tell like you know if you're aware of your body um typically pain is not associated with lymphedema and i have a little asterisk to that statement so um if you if i hear from someone oh my god my shoulder is killing me do you think it's lymphedema as a physical therapist and lymphedema therapist my first thought is it's probably it's probably not however i've worked with enough women um, over the years who do report some pain and discomfort with swelling. So like in this, in school, they say, no, 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 no pain, but I'm not gonna discredit their experience. So some women do feel aches and feel some pain with lymphedema, but typically that's not your first signal. Like I, you know, I would rule some, could be cording, which we'll talk about in a minute, but um, it's probably not lymphedema. Um, so yeah, usually not painful. Okay. And what, so then what happens if you do discover like, oh, oh yeah, this is different. Like this one wrist does not look the same as the other or one leg doesn't look the same as the other. Um, please don't panic. There's no need to panic. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, you will never ever, I promise you this, you will never ever go to bed with two normal looking arms, two normal looking legs and wake up with one gigantic elephant arm or elephant leg like you saw when you Googled lymphedema on the internet. Um, it doesn't work that way. Like those pictures we've seen um, on the internet, God bless Google. Um, those are people that for whatever reason could not get treatment for months, possibly years. Like they are not, you guys are all at this webinar. You are all clearly, um, motivated to monitor for this stuff you are interested you have the wherewithal um it's not it, you won't be that person so please just like i hope that takes some of the stress away about lymphedema um it starts it starts slowly like you'll start to notice like hmm, that's you know um it, it typically will start where like you might notice um like if it's your hand you might notice oh this ring isn't fitting Oh, but then in the morning it does fit again. By the end of the day, it feels tight. Or with your feet, like you wake, if it's you're prone to leg swelling, you wake up, everything looks fine. By the end of the day, like, oh God, that's weird. My left foot's swollen, but my right foot isn't swollen. Um, if you ignored that, typically what'll happen, and I can't tell you when because it's different for everyone, it could be three months, it could be a year and a half, could be five years. Um, at some point it'll stop getting better on its own and you'll wake up and it's the left foot swollen and you'll go to bed in the left foot swollen and then it can get bigger and bigger from there. Um, the, the other reason I want to say is um, to hopefully take some of your pain away is lymphedema, it's, uh, it's not permanent in the way you've been, you may have been led to believe. Like it's talked about as if it's a tattoo, like, you know, once you get lymphedema, you can't ever get rid of it. Like, and that's also very frightening. But it, what I would um, suggest to you is maybe think about it a little bit more like back pain, right? And, and this is why. So uh, back pain, you know, you get to a certain age, it's kind of pretty common. So same with maybe cancer. If you have cancer, it could be common. But um, there's some risk factors. Some people are more prone to it than others. And people's experiences with it are very different. There are some people who have back pain once and then are debilitated for the rest of their life. It's something they're constantly managing. They may end up with surgery for it. Every morning they do their stretches. There are other people where yeah, I've had back pain and then they're fine for a few years and then they have to like, it flares up and they go to the physical therapist and they address it and they deal with it and then it's fine again. And lymphedema is very much like that in how you are going to fall on that spectrum. It's kind of anybody's guess, but it's not a guarantee that if you get it, the rest of your life will be devoted only to managing your lymphedema. Like there's a lot of gray in there. Um, so it just, it breaks my heart. It's funny when I started, uh, practicing as a lymphedema therapist, uh, it was in 2005 at the time, a lot of people, a lot of my patients, I was the first person kind of introducing lymphedema as a topic. As the years went on, women were coming into me like, oh my God, I don't want lymphedema. What's lymphedema? Do I have it? How am I going to, you know, like with this fear and, um, it just kind of breaks my heart. Cause I'm looking at these cancer warriors with like, good God, you guys have faced down pretty scary things and don't let this stupid little thing like add to it like you guys are warriors and so um 
again, soapbox, but I just, it just breaks my heart that this stupid thing is causing so much fear. So I'm trying to, trying to take some of its power away off the soapbox. Okay. So what happens if you get lymphedema and I'll try to like get through this when we talk about courting. Um, so you come visit someone like me, lymphedema therapist. We just kind of like figure out where you are um, with your swelling. If you are someone who like kind of like it's really early, you caught it early, you've been checking your, your ankles or wherever. Um, all you might need is just some education. You might need um, to learn how to do some specific exercises, some massage, maybe we'll get you a compression garment um, and then kind of do a few visits, you're on your way. If you are someone where you're all, you come in and you're like, you know what? It's, it's just bigger than the other side. And even when I, like in the morning it's bigger, by the evening it's still bigger, it's not going back down. If you are that person, then we do what's called complete decongestive therapy. It's the gold, gold star treatment for lymphedema. It involves some sort of compression. Um, it's almost like wearing a cast. We wrap up the limb, either the arm or the leg. You wear that like it's a cast 23 hours a day, come into the clinic, take it off. We do a special massage, the manual lymph massage where we reroute the fluid. So if your lymph nodes are missing here, we help the fluid come over to this, these lymph nodes where they're all still there and happy and working. We do that until, can take up to like three to six weeks for the arm, depending on how long you've had the fluid. Um, we do that until the arm gets as small as it can, ideally back to the size of the other arm. Once it's gotten to be that size, um, we then get you into a compression sleeve. The ones you've probably seen the over the counter, sometimes they're over the counter. Um, and then you probably have to wear that sleeve for a while. Um, uh, burr, burr, burr. So there are pumps out there that can do the um, massage. For some people that's helpful, they are expensive. Um, I personally like the hand version better um, because you can kind of like work around the scars. It's, you know, but for some people, if your insurance covers it, it can be nice to just throw that thing on. And, you know, if it's something you have to do every day. So that's kind of, that was a, a question someone had asked. So just answering that now, um, kind of a case by case basis. But um, last thing, when, uh, actually to, almost done, almost done on lymphedema. Uh, I'm going to talk about compression sleeves in airplanes because that's also a hot topic. Um, you probably have heard maybe from your surgeon, get, all right, you've had your lymph nodes removed, time to get that sleeve for the airplane. Um, that's old news. That's not actually super accurate anymore. Um, I believe it was 2012, uh, the National Lymphedema Network, which is the uh, United States governing body of lymphedema, like they kind of did a big literature review and they put out a position statement saying, you know, guys, we actually don't know if that helps. Um, there's some thought that the way they cram us in like sardines these days, that if you have an arm, a sleeve on your arm and you are seated like this, that maybe you're cutting off your own flow. So um, here's the new, the new, more up to the minute, up to the date recommendations. If you have a history of swelling, 100% wear that sleeve on the plane. If you are at risk for swelling, but you haven't developed it yet, then it's kind of like, me, me, maybe um, talk to your lymphedema therapist is kind of the hitch. Like the, that, then, it's, then it's talk to the, you know, talk to someone. When I'm having that conversation with my patients, we base it on kind of like, what are your other risk factors? Like how... Um, how, how many other factors do you have? Um, what's your personality? Like I've met people who are just like, I don't even want to think about it. I just want to put the thing on. Or conversely, I actually don't want to think about it at all. I don't want to put that thing on. You know, so it's kind of like there's a lot, we just sort of talk about it and come up with um, a decision that everyone's comfortable with. Um, okay, so lastly is, we'll just talk quickly about lymphedema surgery because that's kind of also a new thing. Um, when I, again, when I did my certification in 2005, at the time, all the surgeries were just like, they were not good. They were mostly, um, some version of liposuction, which just, um, like removed all the excess skin and stuff, but kind of damaged some of the lymphatic systems that were left there. And undoubtedly the limb would swell again, and now it would be, it would be hard to treat. And it was just bad news, but uh, again, like I said, I'm in Los Angeles and in the last five years I've seen, I'm starting to see more patients. Um, there's two main types. 
Um, I've seen more of what's known as the lymphovenous anastomosis bypass or LVA. And what that is, though, people who are good candidates have either the stage one, which is where you um, wake up in the morning and things are okay, and then it gets swollen at night, but then you wake up and it's better again, or stage two, where it's like, it's, it's not getting better in the morning, but it's not too bad. Um, and what they do there is like, instead of um, when your lymphatic system's working well, like working normally, eventually all of the lymph fluid ends up getting dumped around here into your veins. What they do is they, like for your arm, for example, they connect the lymph system to the veins like out here somewhere. So like now it's connected to your veins out here and then travels. Like it just bypasses all this lymph vessels by going directly into your veins. Um, I've seen a few patients, maybe, maybe a handful. Um, it's not a cure. It's definitely not a cure. They, you still have to wear a compression sleeve. Um, I, I have not had enough experience yet to say like, yes, I would definitely do it. I can't help it when I'm in the clinic. I always play the, would I do that if I had this game? And jury's still out for me personally, if I would do that, I think I need to see more. Um, the second one is the uh, vascular, vascular, bleh, let's try it for a third time, vascularized, vascularized lymph node transfer, VLNT. That's for stage two or for the people who had the first surgery and it didn't work for them. I know one person who had that, she had really bad, she got infections, infections all the time from her lymphedema. And what they do is they take a clump of lymph nodes from somewhere else in your body and put it where you're missing lymph nodes. Um, so I haven't, I haven't seen enough of that to have a comment, but in general, I'm always a little bit skeptical of those like robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of surgeries, but um, Jenny, yeah. this was so much great information. Yeah. And it's 540. Do, <laughs> right. No, we do need to move forward. So I, I think I'm, what I'm going to ask is um, if you could talk for just five I can minutes. really fast with cording. About cording. Because I want to get to Karen and there are questions also. If yes. there's not enough time, we can always create a blog about some of this information. Yeah. I'm going to give you my quickest down and dirty about cording. Okay. Cording is this weird thing that happens. Um, uh, usually we see it in the armpit after axillary node dissection. We have lymph nodes removed. Um, it can also happen. I've seen it in women who have ports here. Um, it is one of three things. It's either like scar tissue or it's lymphatic tissue or it's veins. And I say it's one or three because literally it's different in each person. It could be different within your own arm. Like it's three different things that happen. Um, and you know you have it because you come in, like I'll, my patients will come in and they'll say like, oh, I have this pain. And it's not like it's tight here. It's like, it is tight right here. And it doesn't feel like, oh, my calf muscle is tight. I want to stretch it. It's like, oh, it feels like if I move, it's something's going to tear inside. It can come all the way down into your hand. Um, it is not dangerous. It will eventually go away on its own. It has nothing to do with lymphedema. Um, if you had a seroma, you're more likely to have it. Seromas aren't dangerous. They're just like pockets of fluid that can come, can happen after surgery. If you had lots of nodes removed, that can be make, make you more apt to have it. Usually happens four weeks after surgery. Um, it eventually goes away on its own. Someone asked, said their PT was working on stretching. It shouldn't hurt to get rid of them. You should be very gentle. It definitely can come back. Like um, usually I see in the clinic, it goes away within like like three to four months, but then something will happen. Usually radiation can make it come back or they start working out a lot and that can make it come back. Eventually it goes away. Um, if you have it, don't worry about it and, and just know it's nothing to do with recurrence, nothing to do with lymphedema. Keep moving your arm, keep stretching. Motion is lotion, as Karen will mention. And um, yeah, you can read my whole PowerPoint for more info, but that's like the down and dirty about it. It's weird, but it's not dangerous. Just don't be scared of it. And that's a perfect segue as you talk about motion to have our next our next presenter come. And she's going to actually show us some, talk about range of motions and show us a few things that we can do. So Karen, welcome to the screen. 
Okay. Thank you Perfect. so much for having me. Really, I feel genuinely privileged to be able to speak with Jenny. Um, my grandmother, who I'm named for, Chaya Clara, actually um, suffered in her life from a variety of cancers, including can um, breast cancer. And when I was single and I would attend breast cancer walks, this would be me. I'd be running up to anyone in a pink t-shirt, congratulations, you're my hero. And then like off to the next one. So it's, it's genuinely a privilege to be able to serve this population. I want to clarify my role as an occupational therapist in general and in treating patients with um, breast cancer, either prior or post some type of resectioning. All occupational therapists are trained in upper extremity. Physical therapists are also trained in upper extremity, depending on the school, the um, degree to which there is an emphasis. Usually the degree is much um, higher for occupational therapists than for physical therapists when it comes to upper extremity. Likewise, some therapists continue in a path, for example, during the day I work in pediatrics, but I work in a hand clinic in the evening and I've had multiple um, rotations in um, in hands in particular. Um, with that said, I um, do not treat cancer patients and I often remark in my education to develop competency in treating cancer patients. Why not? Where are they? Where are they going? Are they being sent anywhere? So the exercises that I'm going to demonstrate to you are the exercises that I would teach you if you came into my clinic. They're the exercises I would recommend as a home exercise program you um, should communicate with your doctor in the course of your recovery, when is it appropriate to incorporate these exercises. There's been some discussion about fatigue. There's been discussion in the chat about pain. We're obviously talking about edema and cording. So all of these exercises are not only safe, but they've been proven efficacious to treat all of those things. So cancer-related fatigue, similar to secondary lymphedema, um, can come about from not moving. And when we have scar tissue that's tough, it can be frightening to move. It could be painful to move. And we want to honor that pain. We want to take it to the edge of the discomfort, but the pain is a warning to back off. So I may recommend, oh, you know what would be beneficial? Do five minutes of this five to six times a day. But where are you going to start? You're going to start with 10. And if 10 doesn't feel good, you're going to start with one. And if 10 feels good, but you could only go an inch, that's where you're going to start. So the first range that we're going to take, and I, I like to use a towel. Karen, before you continue, Please. can you move the mic a little closer to your mouth? Yes. Is that better? We'll see. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> um, a towel or a paper towel. The reason is that you want to create some kind of slip on the surface to give yourself a boost. So. I do this particular exercise with both hands, even if only one side is affected and the other hand acts as a helper. We're gonna get the whole trunk involved. So you're gonna also feel this in your abs. We're gonna push forward, 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 and back, back, back. Forward, 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 and back, back, back. Now, like I said, we're gonna start, we'll do 10 at a time, maybe 10 times three. And as you progress, we could do as much as five minutes at a time, um, five to six times a day. Now, let's say this is my affected side, take back. We're going to do circles. And you wanna make that circle as big as you can. So we're starting with 10, 10 times three, up to five minutes and then the opposite direction. So going out would be external rotation, going in would be internal rotation. These exercises can also be done on a wall. If you're feeling um, that you wanna progress and you're looking for something more aggressive. So I would take either my towel or my paper towel and literally wipe the wall. You can wash the window or you can use your fingers as an assist and simply climb the wall like a ladder as far as you can go to the point of discomfort, but never pain. Let's talk for a moment about scarring. 
So let's say you have a wound. Now, this is applicable for cording. This is also applicable for a surgical scar. We talk about scar massage from the perspective of when the scar is dry, um, but again, you want to consult with your surgeon when is it appropriate to implement this type of activity. So in our clinic, we use a cocoa butter with um, vitamin E. You could use anything. You can use that cucumber melon from, Be from Bath and Body Works. But the cocoa butter, the shea butter, the vitamin E, the vitamin Z has all been proven efficacious for improving the quality of your skin. So you're just going to take a little, again, to create some slip. And I like to work it in. Then what I do from one end, I like to, to the degree that I can tolerate the pressure, you're going to massage in circles approximately 10 times. And then move the finger over another 10 times. When you get to the end, you're going to work it backwards. Now, if you have the ability to use two hands, you can use two hands for the next series, or you can simply use one. We're going to zigzag. So up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, and backwards. Finally, you're going to actually pinch it. The purpose of pinching it, the purpose of all of this, is to prevent adhesions. So if the skin is crossing a joint, and it adheres to the soft tissue underneath, it's going to impact your range of motion. So the exercises themselves will stretch the scar. More directly, we're going to manually mobilize that scar. So you would literally pull at the skin. And in the beginning, it might really resist you, but when I have patients that come into the clinic, I joke with them, I can tell who's been aggressively doing their home exercise because it's so supple under my, my hands. Something else that you can do, again, that's a little more aggressive would be a, a manual massager. And they come, some come with only one setting, come, some come with multiple settings so you can grade the intensity. We have our patients do five minutes of manual massage on a small scar. So remember, if you have a large scar and you're using a small head, five minutes is not a lot of time on each particular spot. So you may want to invest in a larger size massager if you can tolerate um, the vibration. When you have scarring, or you have radiation that's resulted in um, like a neuropathy, or you're having cording that's presenting as a neuropathy, it's not uncommon to have um, paresthesias or other numbness or patchiness of just uncomfortable, unusual sensation. Maybe you're in the shower and it feels uncomfortable, uh, the water on the wounds, maybe certain fabrics are distressing. So what we do is we have a variety of fabrics on sticks. You don't actually need a stick. Um, you can just cut different pieces of fabric or you can make a pile of laundry and take um, between one and ten types. So I tell people start with something like really soft like like a silk or a velvet, a corduroy, work your way up to a terry cloth towel, maybe like a denim. And what you're going to do is simply take the fabric and rub it directly on. So we say for each fabric, you're going to spend about one minute as tolerated. You might have better tolerance for the softer fabrics, and then you might want to spend more time on that and build up to the more intense fabrics. Likewise, you might have decreased sensation, and you may not be detecting the degree of touch. You may not be synthesizing that information. So it's very important to always take a look. So if you're someone who sunburns or easily or if you, you press on yourself, you get red really quickly, you want to be extra cautious. But all of us, all of us who are perhaps experiencing decreased sensation, you want to use your eyes as a backup to make sure that you're not chafing your skin unnecessarily. It's not part of the therapeutic process. For the bigger limbs, like the hands or the feet, if you're having an actual neuropathy, what we recommend is between 5 and 10 minutes in rice. Okay, so do you see what I'm doing? I'm very active, I'm digging, I'm letting it cover my hands. I recommend that you purchase the least expensive rice. Um, cheap rice is very starchy, so the more that you manually handle it, the softer it gets, so it's actually very pleasant over time. 
to increase the complexity, I like to throw in glass marbles. Um, if you have like a stash of buttons, different shaped buttons and textures, and then to challenge yourself to distinguish them from the rice, um, a little bit more intense than the rice would be corn. Still speaking about um, the scars, an option that you can also have, and this is available um, with a prescription or over the counter, would be what's called a scar pad. And the scar pad is actually the size of this box, so it would be very unusual to have a scar quite this size. You can cut this pad to size and store the rest um, for another time. Then you would take either like surgical tape or a sock and net or cut the top of a sock to hold um, the pad in place. You can use the pad several days in a row. You can then wash the pad and let it air dry. You can use it as, as long as you see that it's still adhering. Eventually you'll see that the silicone starts to rub off and it needs to be replaced. We do recommend if you have pets in the house that you keep it um, at a high surface that they can't reach because it smells like you so it makes it appealing to them but it, it could be a choking hazard. Um, different than a scar pad they also sell over-the-counter scar gel and you can use that for your massage instead of um, the vitamin E. The occupational therapist that is not certified in lymphedema is not supposed to do um, lymphedema drainage on a cancer patient. So let's say if I had a, a traditional biomechanical injury, I would definitely do retrograde massage, similar to what Jenny was describing, but not um, to the same expert level. But I would not do that if you came into my clinic. What I could do though, is measure you for the compression garment that would be appropriate. And we can talk about different positioning. So there was um, a participant that mentioned in the chat that sometimes she elevates her limb on a pillow and and that's very helpful. So we can talk about, well, elevation, when is that relevant? Well, are you keeping your hands in your lap? Are you keeping your hands on the table? Can you take breaks throughout the day, raise your hands in the air and pump? to bring circulation to um, the affected area. When you're sleeping, are you waking up and feeling numbness? How can we utilize pillows? Sometimes an outside person is able to brainstorm in a way that you yourself couldn't figure out, um, but you know, you know there's, there's an area that, that can be improved upon. Similarly, some occupational therapists can talk to you about energy conservation and time management or maybe um, your environment. For example, if you're spending a lot of time in the kitchen and you're not able to reach things or you're having trouble with bathing because you can't re raise your arms to wash your hair um, or you're having trouble dispensing soap, what kind of modifications could you make in the meantime without altering um, your environment permanently to be able to reduce some of that tension? Thank you so much for that information, Karen. It's clear that there are, are so many ways um, that work to address some of these issues and, and that's amazing. Um, it's amazing information, very practical. We're gonna just ask two quick questions and then we will get more information out to you in a follow-up. Um, so a couple of things. I know that you said, Jenny, that that um, cording goes away on its own. So there were some questions about um, lymphedema and will it always progress? Is it possible with minor interventions, the massage or the compression sleeves that it will stay where it is or even go away? And then finally, why is it, and is it true, sorry, lots of questions, why is it and is it true that 15 years after surgery, after not having lymphedema, something can happen and somebody will then get it? That last question, uh, your guess is as good as mine, um, but that does happen and there doesn't really seem to be any real good rhyme or reason why that happens. Um, so even if you are like, I'm six years out, so I'm cool, I've never had lymphedema, I'm never gonna get it. Unfortunately, I mean, there is statistics that the longer time goes by, there is less of a risk, but you know, you could be that one person who gets it. It never goes away completely and we don't know why. Um, but yes, there, I want two things that from reading through the chats, I wanted to emphasize. Um, 
when I talk about swelling, lymphedema is asymmetrical. So if a lot of the medications can make people swell. So if you see like your, someone I saw said swelling is neuropathy in your ankles, that's actually not accurate. Like neuropathy is the pins and needles feeling, but if you do see both ankles are swollen or both hands are swollen the same, that's probably not lymphedema and probably from a medication or the heat or something. Um, but yes, a hundred percent, uh, lymphedema does not have to progress to a big mess, like a big giant body part. It, it can stay in a smaller kind of like a, a medium thing. It can go away. Perfect. Last question is, is it's possible. Could you talk a little bit if there's something different about it, about truncal lymphedema or lymphedema yeah. of the breast? Sure. Uh, uh, to talk about that quickly, one, the way you would monitor for that, because you can't just, it's not as easy as comparing side to side. But I would say if you wear a bra, the easiest way that I even look at my patients is I have them keep the bra on and not to be like a weirdo, but like, like if this is my bra, but like where the skin kind of squidges over the bra, like if it looks asymmetrical, or if you have someone at home who can look at them back, you can feel it. There's a lot of times my patients will say, I just feel like there's more tissue here. But what's tricky is a lot of times their sensations a little messed up from surgery. So it's not that then when I feel it, I'm like, yeah, it feels the same to me, but it feels funny to them because of that. So that it's better to look and see if there's a swelling. Um, we treat it the same way. We do the special massage, but obviously we wouldn't bandage you the same way. And we find again, some sort of compression garment that could look like, um, a Spanx top or like they make special kind of bras that have compression. So you would treat it with compression as well. The same kind of thing. Um, and that's same for if you have breast edema as well, you treat it that same way, like finding a special bra. Very much. We are mindful of the time. So I promise you additional information to answer some other questions will be sent out. But I want to take a moment to thank both Jenny and Karen for all they shared. It wasn't just informational. It was incredibly practical. So that's wonderful. Thank you again to GSK, Azai, Merck, CGEN, the CDC, and the Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund. Please take a moment. There is an evaluate, a link to an evaluation survey in the chat or will be in one second. Please take a second. There it is. It's so quick and it really does inform future programming. I do want to remind you that Sherry is here for you and your loved ones to provide emotional support, mental health counseling, and other programs and resources to help you navigate the cancer experience. Again, all are free and completely confidential. You can reach out to us on our website or by calling us. And finally, I want to let you know that we have several exciting webinars on a wide range of topics scheduled for this month. An email went out yesterday, I believe, with a list of several upcoming webinars, uh, but you can also explore and register for the upcoming webinars on our website. And I just saw that link posted. Um, so you have several ways of doing it. Again, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and wish you all a great evening. Can I say one thing fast? I'm so sorry. If you, sure. anyone has questions, this is all in my stupid slideshow. Please just email me. It's in the chat box, PT at gmail.com. I am, would love to answer any of your questions individually. And we'll get that slideshow out as part of the follow-up email in a couple of days. Yay. Thank you very much. Have, Have a great night.